What's up everyone, Tom here and I've been getting quite a few questions recently on this big ass Delta printer behind me. So today I want to shed some light on what it is, why it is and how it is and most importantly what mistakes I made along the way so that you hopefully don't make the same ones. So I'm calling this one the Cerberus Reborn, not to be confused with the Cerberus. And this one is a one meter tall Delta printer, which was mostly a learning exercise for me, but did end up with a few nice tricks up its sleeve. But actually it didn't start out as a Delta. My original intention with the parts used in here was to build a compact high precision machine, similar to what René Jurak is doing with the dice. Unlike him though, I actually gave up on that concept because I had backed that design into such a restricted corner that essentially I ran out of space in the frame and because I really didn't want to throw the original design parameters out of the window and just build another mediocre printer, I ended up scrapping the Cerberus design and started over to design the Cerberus Reborn from scratch. This was my first hands-on experience with a Delta printer, so I wanted to try out as many things as possible to learn as much as I could on them. So my rough parameters for the machine were these. Completely design it from scratch. Check, did that. Make it affordable. Also did that, though affordable is pretty relative. Make it overkill. Yeah, some parts, sure, some others, maybe not. And make it modular. And I think I kind of pulled that one off too, sort of. So the design centers around these slides. These are actually using open builds wheels, but not on open builds extrusions. The real open builds compatible rails are sort of expensive here in Europe, and if you're simply rolling the wheels in the groove of a standard aluminum profile, they'll wear out in no time because they don't have that flat surface to ride against. So what I did here instead was to use standard profiles, V wheels, and have them ride on the edges of the profile, which I've turned 45 degrees. And these do run smoothly, though it looks like there is somewhere after extended use and the biggest downside to not having a rigid aluminum plate to mount the wheels to and instead relying on the plastic's springiness for tensioning is that these aren't really too stiff at all. They're okay for a delta with a light tool head, but nothing more than that. Maybe a brace on the backside of these carriages would help to keep them tightly tensioned. So the carriages have belt clamps and rigid tensioners built in, plus some guidance to keep the belt loop perfectly aligned. And obviously they also provide mounts for the ball ends on the delta arms. Now at the time I just wasn't comfortable using any sort of magnetic joint because I didn't know what sort of force to expect from the delta arms yet. And I didn't want the couplings to fail and be a headache. So I went with these cast iron and brass ball ends, way overkill, much too heavy, and as it turns out, some of these have a lot of play to them. The full set of ball ends cost only about 10 bucks, so that was worth a try for me. They are compatible to Ego's Ego Ball ball ends, and that might just be what I'll end up upgrading to. In the carriage, these are screwed directly into the plastic, not a good choice, I should have at least used this sort of brass insert because the plastic threads just wear out much too quickly with this sort of an alternating load on them. On the other end, the ball ends screw into these aluminum arms. Now these actually worked out really well, yes they do look flimsy, but they only need to take up actual forces and for that they are plenty strong. Plus with them threaded on each end, I can adjust the arm length without having to glue anything in place. On the other end of the arms is the Fector, and this one has two purposes. One, to provide a quick mount for hotends and sensor assemblies, and two, to get the hotend as far up as possible to get the maximum printing height out of the machine. Which, by the way, is 380 millimeters due to the arms being so long, and they're only so long because the ball ends have a fairly restricted range of motion. So for the quick change, quick change. The effector works out incredibly well. It's just three screws and the electrical connections to swap in a different hotend. This effector was sized to have enough space for three E3D V6 hotends in a circular shape, so triangular basically, with a 12mm sensor in their center. I don't think I'll ever be using that, but hey, I'm not going to limit myself there. 
There's also a spot to mount a 80 or 70 millimeter LED ring. Where is it? Right here. Um, but I had to take that one out to make space for the Delta printer mini mount. Uh, what this carriage is lacking are hard points for things like part cooling fans or the PCB that attaches the wiring to the connectors. The next revision of this effector is simply going to have some M3 threaded inserts all around the rim. What's driving the filament through the almost one meter long Bowden tubing is a fairly simple direct drive extruder with an E3D hop goblin inside. Uh, threading in the Bowden coupling on this end was a bit fiddly, but it works at least well enough for this job. The end stops on the top of the printer, they're right, you probably can see that, are these simple six millimeter wide switches. The carriages just bump into them and while it sounds a bit rough, they work perfectly and all three of these together cost less than a tenth of what you'd pay for a single micro switch. So the base of the Cerberus Reborn houses this heated bed. Overkill, here we go. This is a 230 volt, 650 watt silicone heater. For some reason they sent me two so I can show you the second one. It's stuck to a six millimeter cast and milled aluminum plate. And I've got to tell you, this thing in combination rocks. Not only does it heat up insanely fast, but it also gets insanely hot. I've actually had it go up to 200 degrees Celsius when I ran into a bug in Smoothieware and it did just fine. Not that it actually used those kind of temperatures, but it's nice knowing that it'll easily do 150 degrees Celsius should I ever decide to give plain polycarbonate another try. It's actually this bed and SSR I showed off in the solid state relay video and it's been going strong ever since. The bed is sitting on a scrap three millimeter aluminum plate. This is some sort of a construction site color sample, it doesn't really matter, but I liked the upcycled aspect of it. Plus it's red and on its underside, it's home to the electronics. Now I wanted an ATX supply in here because I'd be able to run the control board and a Raspberry Pi from the always on five volt standby rail and then easily turn on the rest of the power supply with the PS on signal. Since then I have become less and less of a fan of ATX supplies for 3D printer applications because unless you buy like a 850 watt unit, which my middle line uses, you often end up running into weird power issues that you just don't want on top of the challenges you have anyways when trying to get a new printer running well. Plus I had to take this one out of its case to fit, which means there's exposed 230 volt AC in this compartment. I know where not to touch it, but I wouldn't be comfortable with anyone else using this printer. The frame is connected to protective earth, so I should be fine on top as long as I don't reach into the bottom compartment. So the brains in here are a smoothie board 5XC and I couldn't be happier with it. There's no way I would have used an Atmega based 8-bit board for a Delta and now that Smoothieware has implemented mesh auto leveling for the Delta kinematics, I can't think of any reason not to use any other platform for a Delta. Except maybe price, sure, um, but I do love how flexibly Smoothie can be configured once you wrap your head around how the setup works. So all the motors in here are 0.9 degree or 400 steps per revolution, which do have a lower top speed ceiling compared to the 1.8 degree or 200 steps per revolution motors. But these do give the printer more accuracy and precision without having to rely on micro stepping. This works well and I'm making 0.9 degree motors my new default for new machines. So for wiring, I'm entirely using CAD5 Ethernet cable. It's super cheap, gives me color coded twisted pairs, ideal for motor, heater and thermistor wires to reduce electromagnetic interference. And for routing it, I actually just jammed and clipped it into the slots of the aluminum profiles. These clips aren't ideal and routinely fall out. A better way to hold the wires in place and make the profiles more appealing would be to use the aluminum covers, which sit flush with the profile surface and hold it in very tightly. Another thing I haven't solved particularly well is strain relief. On the effector, I'm using this proto PCB with the wires soldered on and zip tied to add stiffness. On top, I'm mostly relying on the Bowden tube to keep things in place. What I want to do eventually is to try and establish a standard 
at least for my hot ends, um, so that I can use a single type of PCB that has all the wire connectors on one side and proper connectors for the hot end and sensor on the other end to make them swappable and universally compatible between most of my printers. At least on this one, I've made wiring plans and prepared the machine for a dual extruder setup, so adding that intermediary PCB for one or two extruders should be pretty straightforward. Now one more thing I want to talk about is the frame and its stiffness. So when I originally designed it, the Cerberus Reborn only had the 20mm aluminum profiles connecting the bottom and top triangles. And that was one of the wobbliest printers I've ever seen. It did print, but you can easily see the effector swinging around by more than a centimeter after an abrupt move. So first I tried adding these polystyrene sheets um, to two sides, so the two back sides, just this and the other one over here. Um, the plan was to use a clear one on the front as a door. Unfortunately, polystyrene is A, not that stiff, and B, super freaking brittle. So within a week, both white panels had a corner broken off, and at that point, I switched them out for these aluminum plates. These are four and five millimeter thick, I believe, and they give the printer frame an enormous amount of stiffness, plus, plus, I can still attach what's left of the polystyrene sheets between them and eventually enclose the build volume that way. I just have to figure something out for these edges because I can't actually attach anything to the aluminum profiles as the wheels ride on those corners. So overall, I'm already very happy with how the Cerberus Reborn turned out and I think it's about time for it to replace my Mendel 90. Let me know if you'd enjoy a design breakdown like this one for the old workhorse of mine before I send it to a better place. And to leave out that euphemism, yes, I am planning on gutting this printer and maybe rebuilding it. I don't know yet, but it's in need of a lot of love and care before I'd call it representable. And I'm not sure if I'm ready to commit to that. We'll see. Well, anyways, that's it on the Cerberus Reborn. If you've got any questions left on it, leave me a comment below and I'll try to answer them. If you enjoyed this video and want me to make more in its style, like and share it. And if you want to support this general thing I'm doing here, consider subscribing or directly throwing me a dollar or two over on Patreon. And that's it for today. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.